Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I'm pleased to uh, be able to introduce Kevin Murphy, who's uh, at the University of British Columbia, right, very close to here. Uh, today he's going to be talking about computer vision, but he's done work in lots of different areas, I guess all tied together roughly by probabilistic modeling and generally focusing on graphical models. Mm -hmm. And so today, today he's going to talk about some vision work. Great. Thanks, Chris. So, um, so this is mostly work that I did when I was a postdoc at MIT with Antonio Tarava and Bill Freeman. Um, and at the very end of the talk, I'll mention some more recent things I've done, which I decided not to talk about, but you can ask me if you're interested. So, um, so the, the story is this. Um, the, a search engine for the real world, so this, that's a phrase from Alan Mackworth. The idea is that you want to find objects in the physical environment instead of on the web. So imagine you know, you're looking for your keys or the, I'm going to use a, um, a more prosaic example. Find your computer mouse. Okay, hey Paul. Um, so let's suppose you're an autonomous robot and the, the user says, go find my mouse for whatever reason. So this is a stand-in for a more interesting search task. So the way that seems uh, sensible to approach it is to use some sort of top-down approach. So you don't want to ex exhaustively apply some object recognition device to every single patch of image. So what you might want to do is try and do some place recognition and say, well, am I out on the street or in a corridor or in an office? and just move, move around until at least you're in an office because you know the offices are likely to contain um, mice, computer mice. So basically um, the intuition we're using there is that you can have a histogram of the kinds of objects that occur in different scene categories and we'd like to first identify this type of scene and focus our attention there. Okay, so once we get into the appropriate room, um, we're in some office setting. Now we want to um, narrow down our search to areas within an office that are likely to contain the target. So um, we might want to sort of run a desk-like, a desk clutter detector to give us uh, regions to focus our attention on. Now once we've found a desktop, um, we might want to then predict where on the desk we should start looking. So um, I'll talk about ways of using what's called the gist of the image, uh, which is, this is a notion from psychology where you look at the image as a whole and um, I'll operationalize that later. But we're going to use the gist of the image as sort of a low resolution version to predict where we might um, conduct a, start a more detailed search. And then um, we're going to, that's going to give us some area, sort of prime our attention on some region of the image. And then we're going to run essentially a standard object detector um, in that region. So we'll use a, a boosted object detector that I'll explain. Um, and you know, lo and behold, it will zoom in on the right object hopefully. But sometimes um, it might miss the target. So mice are very indistinct and um, oftentimes the objects that we're looking for um, can only be really recognized by using the context of other neighboring objects. So it might be that the fact that we see a keyboard is what enables us to discriminate this as being a mouse as opposed to like a white splotch of color. Um, so we're going to try and use spatial relationships between objects as well um, at the ends to, to disambiguate. So that's basically the, the outline of the talk. So I'm now going to I'll now basically recapitulate that whole search procedure from top to bottom um, and fill in some of the details. So we'll start with the scene categorization um, problem. So this is work we published in ICCV. And um, the setup is, is quite straightforward. We're going to use supervised learning. So we'll collect some training data, and I'll show you how we collected the data in a moment. And so we'll label these kinds of scenes as being offices, these as being corridors, these as being streets, and so on. So we have about five scene categories. And uh, this is actually very similar to place recognition. Um, so place recognition is basically, it's like class versus an instance problem. So the scene recognition is the class level problem, and place recognition is the instance level problem. So this is um, not just an office, but it's Office 610 as opposed to Office 615. So um, there are obviously more, many more instances of places than there are categories of places. But we will want to solve this problem, too, using essentially the same techniques. Um, although intuitively, the features that you might need to discriminate one office from another might be different than discriminating categories of offices from categories of streets, say. Um, and we'll see that in the results later. Yes? Maybe you're about to answer. You're only using, like, still images for your inference? No, we'll, we'll use video. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. No, no, please feel free to interrupt. So uh, I'm just, uh, right now I'm explaining it just as a static problem. So we'll take, it's a supervised learning setup. So we'll take some, um, some images and we've labeled them and we'll just pass it into some classifier. So is, is your main motivation literally a, a robot trying to find a particular object and you want to first go to the office then go to the desk and find something? It's kind of a cover story. I, I'm doing a historical recreation of... <laughs> work that we did. Uh, in this case, we, were, we wanted a real-time device which would tell us where we were and um, what objects are likely to be in the scene. And the sort of the search story is just a, 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 um, a story. We're holding interesting problems together. Exactly, yeah. So, so it seems like it's a little bit impoverished even if you use video because if you're really trying to figure out where you are, there's, you know, 802.11. Absolutely. Range finders. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're not, uh, if we really cared about solving the place recognition problem or the localization problem, we could use other technologies and other signals in particular. Um, but this is really, um, how far can we push vision? We're interested in computer vision problems as opposed to solving this specific problem. Like how far can you get with vision alone? Um, so that's sort of the exercise. So, um, okay, so supervised learning is straightforward. The classifier doesn't really matter what we use. We're gonna use boosted decision trees. Um, but what matters more are the features, as we all know. So the features that we use for representing an image um, is this thing called the gist that I mentioned earlier. So the idea of the gist of an image, this sort of holistic representation has been around, but the question is how do you operationalize that? So um, Antonio Taralba and Odd Oliver proposed one approach which, we've, which we found to work very well. So basically you just take your image and you pass it through a filter bank. So this is a steerable pyramid. Um, and uh, then you just do dimensionality reduction using PCA. And the details don't particularly matter. We've tried various filter banks, Gabor filters and um, steerable pyramids and, and so on. And um, it, so that is pretty robust to what kind of filters you use. And also the, it's fairly robust to what dimensionality reduction you use, including no reduction. You can just use the raw um, energy of filter responses. Um, we just do this mostly for computational convenience. But that's what I'm gonna call the gist of the image. Yes. Oriented energy. It's oriented energy. Yeah, so we basically look at the, uh, the filter response and look at the an average energy um, in each of the bands and average that spatially and then do PCA. So it's a, it's a nonlinear reduction. Um, so let, here's a more intuition about what it's capturing. So um, this is an image pair um, and they have the same gist. Okay, so what that means, and this, these two also have the same gist. So they project to the same feature vector. Okay, so what that tells you is that essentially the gist is picking up on the coarse spatial texture layout of the image. Um, so it sort of can distinguish uh, building facades from this sort of a receding horizon corridor-like effect. Um, so this is very curious now. So, you, so the, the representation of Heger and Bergen are these histograms of oriented energy, not oriented energy actually, oriented, uh, these, these essentially wavelengths. Called yeah. That's right. They're, not, they're, non, they're linear, I believe. That's good because they're, they wanted them to be invertible. Yeah. So can you tell me exactly what you did to compute the top image, the bottom image, and the top image? Yes. So they, they, we're not using the same method as Heger and Berger. It, this is just a, basically this image was generated by taking white noise yeah. and computing its gist and looking at the difference between the gist of this and the gist of the real image and then doing essentially a random perturbation until you reduce that difference. I see. So that's the only thing it has in common with Heger and Berger. It's, okay. just, it's just a way of visualizing, you know, what other things project to, to this, this same feature vector. I see. But it, you can, even without looking at that image, just the, the mechanism is that we're, we do a, um, you know, a wavelet analysis of the image essentially and then we just compute the average energy of, of the response to each of the filter banks in you know, the four <coughs> quadrants and then do PCA on that. So it's just measuring how much sort of spatial texture there is in each of the quadrants. So that we do have a little bit of spatial layout. It's not averaged over the whole image. Right. Um, but the block size is not too critical. But th there's sort of an empirical trade-off that, you know, uh, Antonio has been working on this for several years. This is 2001, right? Um, and we did try various variants, small, you know, uh, variations on the, the basic setup, and they're all essentially the same. So I'll show you how well it works. So um, this, is how we, this is how we collected the data. So we, we were in a hurry to make a, a demo. So um, we got some webcam and uh, we were kindly donated a cardboard box. 
So that's version one of our data collection device. And this thing here, this is just a standard heads-up display. So this is not the Media Lab. This is CSAIL at MIT. Not so glamorous. Um, this is what, uh, so what you're seeing in the heads-up display is anything your computer can project. So initially, it's just going to be performing cat scene categorization and, and place recognition. Okay. And uh, this is version two. This is my colleague Antonio. So it's the same hardware. It's a slightly better helmet. Um, <laughs> so um, I actually don't, I forgot to include the results of just static recognition, but it, I think it's pretty clear that just recognizing places from single frames is going to be pretty hard. So uh, you, this is a typical frame you might get from that wearable camera. And it's, does anyone want to guess what kind of thing that is we're looking at? Half a 610. <laughs> pretty good guess, but. Um, so it's obvious that from isolated frames it's pretty hard, but if you get a little movie clip, then um, you'll be able to disambiguate uh, quite well. So that was clearly, a, you're looking at a wall, you just happen to be turning around inside the corridor. So um, we're going to use video, not just static frames. So the setup is um, very simple. We'll have a static classifier here. In this case, I've drawn it as a generative model, as a mixture of Gaussians, but we've also looked at CRS and discriminative models. And now we're going to link the places across time. So essentially, this transition matrix, so the state space are the discrete labels, either representing the scene category or the spatial location. And um, this, tran this transition model is just a topological map, as in mobile robotics. So the nice thing is for indoor navigation, you know, we already have a notion of discretization of space, which is offices already give us a notion. So we just have one state per, per office. Um, so that defines the state space. Outdoors is a little trickier because how do you discretize an outdoor space? And so we sort of just chunk it up into basically visually distinct regions. Um, but some of the errors that we get are due to sort of arbitrary decisions to, to divide a street into two subcomponents. So we have no notion of how far we've traveled along uh, within, a, within a, a region. We could estimate that from flow or whatever, but we didn't do that. So you have to set the number of locations by hand? Yes, we do. And yeah. Yes, and it, I mean, indoors is straightforward. Outdoors, we, we, just, we just broke it up by hand. It's all supervised. Yeah, now, of course, there's, you could look at unsupervised learning, and you could estimate the number of regions and so on, but this is very simple stuff that we did. So this is for places. Now, for scenes, essentially, you use the same HMM transition matrix, but you can think of it as a more, at a more abstract level. So you're saying, what's the probability of getting from any office to the lobby? Well, typically, you go via a corridor. You can't usually go directly from an office to the street. So this is sort of supposed to be general purpose knowledge that will transfer from one building to another. And I'll demonstrate that shortly. OK, so we um, it's supervised learning, so it's super easy, right? And we're just doing max likelihood. Um, and we can combine the scene and the place recognition devices systems but just by making this factorial HMM type model. OK, so if you train that up and use that feature vector I mentioned, this is how it works. So. Um, so this is actually, we actually got it running in almost real time in MATLAB. Um, the steerable pyramid code was in C, it's from Eros Simoncelli, but everything else is in MATLAB. So it's a very, very lightweight system. I mean, it's, it's just an HMM with a small state space. So here it's saying this is an office, and specifically it's building 400, floor 6, room 628. And uh, when it's read, it's an error. When it's sufficiently confident, it will display the label. Um, so it knows it's a corridor, it doesn't know which label, so it's below threshold, it's not showing it. And now it realizes that it's this, this particular corridor. And um, some of the boundaries, it, it gets wrong. But on the whole, it's doing quite well. So that gives you some flavor of the quality of the data and so on. Um, so here's another way of visualizing the performance. So these are a subset of the places versus time. And um, the red curve is the truth, the ground truth um, of where we are. And the black dots represent our belief states as the probability distribution over locations. And you can see that it's tracking very well. Most uh, um, pretty much all the time with a few confusions here. Um, I'm not sure I can explain all of these. these this one is like, it's confused between Dr Draper Street and 200 Side Street, which some people who know the MIT campus, I mean, they're basically adjacent. It's, that's, that's certainly an artifact of the discretization. So, um, OK, so that's place recognition. And that's been studied in mobile robotics for a long time, uh, mostly using lasers, not vision. But it's not that novel. The, the main novelty was this notion of not just recognizing specific places, but whole like, categories of environment. So suppose that you know, I train it up at MIT and I take it to MSR. It's not going to be able to recognize specific room names. 
Um, but it should, so I'm in some new environment. It won't know where it is. But it should still be able to tell me that I'm in a conference room versus a street or whatever, even if it doesn't know the specific name. So, um, so if we run the systems in parallel, what we did is we trained it on one MIT building and tested it on another. And so it didn't know um, the specific locations, but it was still able to categorize the type of location. And then when we returned to the um, familiar location, it, carried on, it picked up on the specific place and tracked location like it did on the previous slide. Um, and it turns out that, so we used, um, we, we tried various um, models, but when we used um, boosted decision trees as our classifier, it was able to pick up on different subsets of features for those two different tasks. So we found that for um, the place, rec sorry, the scene categorization, it was helpful to use black and white filter banks of the kind that I described. But we also compared it just to sort of color histograms of the whole image. And color histograms of the whole image work very well for specific place localization, but not for categorization, which kind of makes sense, right? So in, in our data set, it turns out that building 400 where I was had this sort of general color scheme of brown. And the other building um, where the vision group was um, was mostly blue. So you could just use color to tell which building you're in. But if you wanted to recognize categories of things, color is sort of artifactual. So it's better to ignore color and focus more on the, the, um, the filter bank type features. So um, that makes sense in hindsight, but the algorithm could do the feature selection for us. OK, so that's scene recognition and place recognition. Um, but we really want to actually detect objects. So we're going to use that as essentially a top-down prior and use it to prime um, what objects uh, we might expect to see and where we might expect to see them. So um, here is that plot that I showed earlier. So this is a set of places over time. And if we, we, we collected a large data set, which is now on the web, called LabelMe. And um, we annotated objects that were present in many of these frames. So um, this is the ground truth estimate of which, which of these objects are present in each of the frames. And if you're able to do place recognition and you know which objects are in each place, you can just obviously predict which objects are, are likely to be present. And you see there's a pretty good correspondence. But this is, so it works quite well, but this is kind of unsatisfying because it's essentially just memorized its training set, right? It knows, oh, in my office, there's, there's a computer and a coffee cup and so on. So it's not going to generalize. I'm sorry, this is the prior? Just, just this is just... Um, there's no observations of pixels? The, it, the only observations of pixels are being fed into the place recognition system. Okay. And then it's doing top-down prediction of which objects are present. But there's no verification, at a, at a, certainly not at a pixel level. Um, so it, nevertheless, it does quite well. But you know, OK, that's just because it knows where it is. So um, what if you go, take, go to a new environment? Then obviously, you're going to get weaker kinds of predictions. But um, we want to see how, just how weak or how strong they are. So there are several ways you could go, right? So we want to predict which, so ob is an object of category i present, given g is the gist of the image? So one approach would be to first um, fit these histogram type things. So this is the probability object I is present in a scene of type S, where S might be office street or corridor. And then what's the probability or in a scene of type S given the gist, using the techniques I just described. So that's one way of solving it. Or you could just directly predict object presence from the gist and get rid of the scene stuff. Um, another approach would be to directly predict object presence using some local object detector, like a boosted detector. Um, so we'll, essentially what we're going to do is compare these two approaches and naturally, they essentially have complementary signals. So we're going to try and combine the, the, the gist or the global information with the local detector because they're bringing orthogonal information sources. And naturally, since there's more information, this will work the best. So um, I'll just explain how we do that. So for this part of the talk, we're actually, um, let me see, we're going to ignore the scene. So we're going to uh, look at methods two, three, and four. But you can actually put the, the advantage of including scenes as a sort of extra latent variable is you can smooth it over time using HMMs, um, as I just described. But for simplicity, we'll, we'll turn that part of the model off and focus on the static case. So um, this is just some results. Um, I ha so the methodology, let's see. No, I don't have a slide on methodology. So the methodology is we're going to use, it's a binary classification problem. We're going to use boosted decision trees. Um, G is the gist, like I just described. And L is a local object detector that I'll explain um, shortly. And um, I made these slides a while ago, and I've forgotten if I explain how to combine these. But if I don't, I'll come ask me again if I don't explain it. So um, if we look at the three systems, just to see how it performs first before we go into the details, 
Um, what we can do is take some images and we can rank order them by the probability they contain the target. So let's suppose we're looking for computer monitors. So um, if we um, sort them by probability of monitor given the gists, um, we get this ordering. And so there are some false positives there. And if we say set a 50% threshold, this would be a false negative. If we look at a local detector based on um, boosted decision trees applied to some features that I'll explain, um, we get a different ordering and arguably more errors. And if we combine the two, we get a much more, in this case, it's error-free if we make 50% our cutoff. And um, same thing for cars. Um, essentially, using both information sources, we get a more natural ordering. And if we cut off at 50%, there are no errors. I guess 45% in this case. So um, if we look at the ROC curves for the, the different um, classes that we considered, we're looking at pedestrians, side views of cars. So this is a view dependent detector, whether there's a keyboard and whether there's a screen. And so the methods are um, dotted green line is a local detector based on boosting. Um, the dotted blue line is this um, gist based prediction that just uses the gist in a binary classifier to say is it likely to be in the image. And the red is the one that uses both. So um, red is the best in every case. But what's interesting is that you know in some cases the gist does quite well. Um, in fact it beats a local object detector. So now that might be, you can argue that's because we have a crap local object detector, but I'll show you that our local object detector is, at least as of you know, a few years ago, it was state of the art. Um, so, um, well, it also depends on the types of categories of objects you choose. I mean, if you choose, I mean, they these things are parsimonious with respect to the kind of, like, of course, like if you choose computers, they probably won't be on the street, you know, whereas if you choose like a person, it might be on the street and in the office, and then they just might help you less. Yeah, so, right, so people are less predictable by context because they can go anywhere. So that's true. Um, and so, well, we're still getting a win, but we, we get more of a win for things like keyboards and screens and cars. I mean, you can just recognize if you're indoor or outdoor, and that's a very strong prior about whether the object's present. So um, I just, I had to peek at my slides. I, I, they're maybe not ordered optimally. I do explain the detector later. But let's focus on the top down, the gist part for the moment, because we're still walking top down. Um, so um, what we're going to try and do is learn a mapping from whole images to uh, predicted regions that are likely to contain the target. So um, the setup is, again, supervised learning. So the input feature vector will be the gist, as before. And now the output is um, the location and scale of the target object. So it's a regression problem. And uh, we've tried various methods. We've tried boosted regression. I think in the results I'm showing you, we're using a mixture of experts. Um, it's, it's, slight, it's a slight variant of mixture of experts. So this is just your, it's just, this is the input, that's the output, and this is a latent variable. And it's a, uh, we actually use a nonlinear version, which is um, a neural network with some extra discrete hidden nodes. But we've tried other things, and they're all basically the same. Um, the, this gives you a probability distribution over the output, which is important for fusing with other information sources. So we don't just want a point estimate. OK, so how well does that work if you train that up? Um, so what happens is this. Um, if you look at the true uh, horizontal location of an object and the estimated horizontal location, there's essentially no correlation. right? And the reason is makes sense, whereas that we're, um, for the vertical location, we get a fairly good regression line. So if you look at this image, a person could be essentially anywhere in that horizontal band. And this gist is just capturing overall spatial layout. And it's not able to tell you where within that band the person is. But it is able to localize it vertically. So it's more likely to be in the, at this height of the image than up there or down there. And as I, I'll show you a movie later. When the camera moves around, the prediction will also follow it. Um, but so we can predict vertical location and scale to some degree, but not horizontal location. So, um, so let's, put, let's see where we're at so far. Let's put these pieces together. So um, this is the gist of the image. And we're going to use it for scene recognition, which is being shown here. And we can also use it for object presence prediction. So this is, is the keyboard present or not. And it, it thinks it is likely to be present, so it highlights that part of the, of the image. And when it shortly will go outdoors, and it will say it's a street scene. So therefore, it will predict that cars are present and keyboards are not. And this will be illuminated. And the sort of lozenge shape within, within each frame is um, the result of that neural network that I just described. It's predicting a region within the image that's likely to contain the target. And this is all, um, as I mentioned before, this is, very, this is top down. It's very fast. It's, it's almost real time in MATLAB. 
Um, so it's a very lightweight system. The flickering is because I turned the HMM off. So it's, this is now isolated frames. But you can do temporal smoothing um, and uh, get rid of that annoying flicker. OK. So, um, so that's fine. It's giving you a pretty good handle on which objects are likely to be present and where they're likely to be present. But you then need to essentially verify your hypothesis and actually look, well, is it there or not? So for that, we need a, um, a local object detector. So we might have you know, zoomed in on this region, but now we want to essentially apply um, some more, sp more high-resolution high detector to verify the object. Yes? This, this thing about this horizontal band, it seems to be an artifact of the way that the video is coming in, right? It's kind of like there's a person of a particular height who's moving around like this. Yeah. Whereas in another model, it's the, I like to look at people, right? And I always put them in the center of my... Yeah, so it will... Maybe, maybe I... If your database is such that you know people are nearly always in the center of the frame, it will learn that distribution. So in fact, um, but that's with the data we collected, they could have been anywhere. So it learns that well in the. I mean, we, these are arguably fairly natural data collection conditions. Walking around with a camera on your head. So um, you know maybe that you know you, if you have a specific database, if it's an image retrieval task, you might want to tune your distribution to that database. Um, but we didn't build that in a priori, but. Um, you know, it says basically I can't predict horizontally. Okay, so um, so that's what the gist is giving us. So that it gives us this uh, vertical band to focus on. But now we're going to um, use a um, a detector that looks at more uh, local pieces of the image. So there are many many approaches to object detection. Obviously, so this talk is not going to innovate on the object detection side. Um, it's more a sort of systems integration approach and trying to combine some te existing technique with other information sources like the gist. So basically, just to summarize though, um, the kinds of things that you could do, I mean, there are approaches that use appearance or geometry or both, and um, you can use an interest point detector or you could run it densely all over the image. You can handle articulated objects like a sort of graphical model for people, or it could be just some template type approach. It could be a generative model, a discriminative model. So there's, all of these combinations have been tried. We tried something simple and popular. Um, popularized by Paul Voller, actually, and now everybody uses it, which is a boosted detector. Um, so we'll use the standard sliding window classif um, classifier approach, where we classify every patch of the image as containing the object or not. And um, uh, this is you know, suitable for rigid objects like cars and screens, and less so for people. But for walking pedestrians, it's OK. Um, so just this is a nice little movie I got from Leon Seagal. For those who haven't seen this, probably everyone knows this. So you just slide your classifier along. and there, yeah, boom, you classify that as a foreground object and everything else is background. So this is an old technique. Um, and what Paul did was to show how well boosting does for this task and also um, came up with the notion of a computational cascade, which we don't use here, but we could. So, um, and we repeat it at multiple scales to handle objects at different sizes. So uh, it's a yet another supervised learning um, setup. And we have labeled data. We just extract some features I'll explain shortly. And then you pass it into your favorite classifier. Um, and the features tend to make a bigger difference than the classifier, um, as long as your classifier is reasonably flexible. So we use these boosted decision trees that everybody knows. And the motivation is that they've been shown to work well, but also they perform feature selection. So if you have a large feature vector, you don't know which features are relevant, then um, the, if you um, use one of these degenerate decision trees of height ones, also called a stump, it's going to pick out um, the weak learner has to choose which dimension D it should look at, so which feature. And it's going to compare it to a threshold and then put a linear ramp on it. So that's what a, a boosted decision stump is. So the, um, the features that we use are the following. So this is sort of a, a union of various ideas that people have proposed. So, um, and we've tried other things in the past. But what we're going to do is we're going to extract from our training set a set of random fragments of the image at different sizes. And they're going to be um, essentially centered on so th this, we might have a training image like this. We are going to cut out random pieces of the image. So for example, the top right corner of a screen. And then we're going to, um, along with that image fragment, there will be a corresponding label fragment, which specifies which of these pixels are from the foreground and which are from the background. So this idea was um, first invented, I think, by Borenstein and Ullman. So um, our weak learner will, so we're going to extract a large number of these random fra fragments, so say 500, and we'll call that a dictionary. And our weak learner will do the following. And it, it basically applies this procedure to every pixel in parallel. 
So it picks a random element from the dictionary, like this fragment, and it does normalized cross-correlation um, with that fragment. So essentially it says, where in the image can this fragment be found? So maybe it fires there. And then we um, convolve with the corresponding mask. So that simply copies the mask onto all of the peaks um, where the correlation fired. So in this case, we get this little piece of the jigsaw. And if we do this many, that's one weak learner. If we do this many, many times, we're going to basically put little pieces of the jigsaw on top of each other, and we'll end up carving out the shape of the object. I'm sorry, so the net result is a binary mask, and that's the result of the weak learner. Yes. And when you, and it's zero, it's either plus or minus one or zero if there's no mask. Yes. Okay. So, so real it's, real it, it's real number. So this, yeah. this would be, um, this is a weak learner, and then we, we learn the coefficients, like the regression slope and the offset. So it becomes a real valued mask at the end. And you throw away negative normalized correlation? You only keep or do you just? Um, what do, I think we just look at the absolute value. So we're just trying to find the locations. Okay. We're not so, worrying about so, the polarity. So if you, if you flip, it'll still fire. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And otherwise, I mean, other, you, you might need a larger dictionary to sort of handle symmetric cases. Yeah, so we, it's random, but it has to overlap with the training objects, right? Yeah, and our negative examples are random from the background. Uh, and they're just different sizes, and they... And you need to carefully label your sort of carve out the objects. In your training. Yeah, so this is fully supervised learning, so that was sort of labor intensive. But now, now um, that data is on the web, and there's a, there's a GUI you can use to create more labeled data. And people do. People voluntarily label data for fun. So it's actually, if you need labeled training data, there's tens of thousands of images now for free at MIT, uh, which of this kind of quality. Um, which is to say not perfect, right, because there are unlabeled objects here. And sometimes it's even worse that there are objects that you know about that are not labeled. So it's incomplete, but it's the biggest available. Um, and obviously, you know, there's interesting work on semi-supervised learning, but we, we didn't pursue that. So uh, that's our, our weak learner. So we basically, um, every round of boosting is going to pick one of these fragments and pick one of these masks and then fit the corresponding coefficients. And um, it will pick the appropriate fragments to use. So if we train that up using boosting and we use maybe, well, we use a cross-validation to pick the number of rounds, but it's usually about 50 to 100. So it's not that many features that you need. Um, and we have tried it on the car side data set from UIUC. Then we're getting very good performance on the multi-scale version of that data set, which is harder than the single-scale version. This is our... Um, this is a precision recall plot with unusual axes. So it's recall versus one minus precision, which is the convention they use in their paper. So this is us, and this is their method, um, Akerwell and Roth. Now, other groups since then have, have uh, um, gotten at least as good, in fact, probably better. But the point is that this very simple technique I described is essentially as good as everything else out there, on, or at least on this data set. And the criterion here for success is that the... Um, predicted location of the object overlaps with the true location by a sufficient degree. So the output of the weak learner is a, is a mask, right? So is this like a, is the box you're drawing? We, the, then we do, so we do the usual non-maximal suppression thing and find the modes of that response and, and declare those to be, to be our target object locations. And, the and then we threshold that. And so the bounding box we know from the size of the patch. So, and we run it at multiple scales, so we can estimate the scale of it. So I, I, I skipped some steps, but what, we get a dense thing, and then we just threshold it. Like, like all of these sliding window classifiers do the same thing. Um, okay, so this just shows that you know, it's, it's at least a, okay, um, a reasonable method. So now what we want to do is combine that with the, the gist stuff that I talked about in the beginning of the talk. So what we're getting out of boosting is what's the probability the object is in location i as a function of the local detector. And what we get out of the gist-based priming is what's the probability that it's in i given the gist. And the way we combine it is just to multiply them together. So it's a product of experts model. But they have different degrees of confidence. So we allow ourselves a tuning factor, gamma, which we set by cross-validation. And another, maybe a more principal way to think about that is as a um, log linear model. Um, and then you renormalize. Um, but intuitively, it makes sense, right? We're using this essentially as a, as a mask to gate out all the false positives that our sliding window detector is giving us. So there are probably smarter ways to combine these information sources. but. This is what we use here. And if you do that, this is what results. So what I'm showing, um, the top two lines, I'm trying to detect screens. And if we run our boosted detector, here is a false positive. If we look at our combined detector, it gets the screen correctly. Here's a false positive for the boosted detector. It's firing on a picture, which is you know, not an unreasonable false positive. With the gist, the gist says, no, I expect it to be a bit bigger, because this is a close-up shot. 
and maybe it's more likely to be in the middle of the screen, so it detects this. Here, um, the, bo the boosted detector did get it, but the gist says, well, I actually think it might be a bit smaller than that. Um, so it tunes in a little bit tighter. And um, this may or may not be a false positive, depending on your you know, uh, criterion for scoring. And here's a similar story for keyboards, right? False positive, correct detection, false negative, correct detection, um, probably a false negative, correct detection. Uh, it's not always improving, but generally it improves. And more, this is an outdoor object. So how does the GIST uh, provide information about the expected scale of the object? We treat scale as just like, we, it's a regression problem. So we predict x, y, and scale. And scale is the diagonal of the bounding box. And so that tells us. So we're running the uh, classifier at multiple scales in the pyramid. And the GIST is saying, well, I think it's going to be this level of the pyramid, you know, plus or minus a few. And then we can essentially mask out all the false positives from the bigger and smaller scales. So why not just Shove just features into the boosting instead of having two separate. Um, yeah, we could do that. Uh, this is sort of a more modular because we've already trained up the just uh, based yeah. thing. But yeah, we could certainly do that. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. So um, more more results outdoor images and so a little bit more quantitative for those four categories. So as before, green is the boosted detector, light blue is the just based detector, and red is combined. So red is always best. Now, um, no, this is pretty bad results for people. <laughs> I mean, our person detector is terrible. Uh, but, you know, our methodology is very simple. Um, also, our car results are not great. Keyboards are pretty poor, but they're very hard to find. That's a difficult object. Our car is, we've gotten better results since with slightly better features. But our car results are much worse than the UIUC. But this is a very, very hard test set. It's much harder than UIUC. So um, everybody finds it difficult. This stuff? No, 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 like way back. This? No, up, up whole, you don't have to go back, but oh. just slide back where you're showing the, the um, pedestrian That's MIT. Everything, every, all the results I'm showing on the MIT database, except that one slide. Okay. But, the, but maybe, okay, so it, why were they so much better before? Yeah, yeah. I was solving a different problem then. I, I, I haven't been clear. I was solving, just predicting whether the object is anywhere in the image. Oh, I see. So that's called presence detection. So this is the top-down approach. Is it there or not? And then having condition on it being there, where is it? So localization is much harder. So people get extremely good results on, they call it object detection, but what they mean, I call it presence detection. Like, is it in the image or not? And you can basically, you can use just random, people said, oh, I'll run an interest point detector and I'll do bag of words and I'll pass it into an SVM and they get great results. But now subsequent to that, people have shown, you can take random patches of the image and pass them into the SVM and get great results. Um, because essentially, by chance, you'll pick up on something indicative of the object presence. Oh, not even overlapping with the object. No, not necessarily. It might oh. co-occur. Like, just because the data, not on MIT, mind you, but on these easier databases like Caltech, random patches plus SVM does as well as anything else. <laughs> this was at CVPR last year. And it's enough to tell you about presence in those. Yeah, well, it just looks at the whole thing, not random. But, yeah. but th that was on MIT. I don't know how well the random patch will work on MIT. But the presence detection is definitely an easier problem. So localization, which is what we're focusing on now, is considerably harder, of course. So, um, and also our criterion for localization is fairly strict. So we're using this Pascal criterion. Um, so, you know, so the results don't look as good, um, but it's, it's harder. OK, so here's a little movie of that running. Um, more interesting than PR curves. So we're doing the, this is the gist prediction of where the car might be, and then we overlap that with the um, boosted detections. And I think red is the strongest, and green is the second strongest. If it's above threshold, then we, we plot the result. So that you, there was a false positive there. It doesn't get the truck. Um, so it's not perfect. And we're training it. Every view is trained separately, so it's a view-dependent classifier. Um, I've done separate work with Antonio on sort of sharing features across views, um, but that, that's a different talk. I think I'll skip that. OK, so, so what we've done so far is to take sort of a standard object detection methodology and then added additional um, top-down information from the gist and shown that that helps. But uh, another source of context in addition to sort of top-down information about scenes is na neighboring objects, right? so spatial constraints. So that's um, intuitively clear. So, you know, the gist might be able to predict that the, the mouse is somewhere in this region, but it can't predict where within that horizontal band, as we saw. So we might know that mice are, you know, to the left or to the right of keyboards, but they're generally at the same level as keyboards, and keyboards are below screens. 
So we'd like to use those kinds of spatial constraints. Now, this is actually much harder to model, um, th these kinds of issues. So let's just look at a couple of approaches people have taken. So one is just pixel labeling or patch labeling. Um, so essentially, um, you, you could imagine some sparse thing where you have a notion of objects and you try and connect one object to another. But this is a dense approach. So this is going to label every patch of the image. This is a result from one of my colleagues. So they're saying this is fox in the middle and snow and, and so on. So they used essentially a nearest neighbor grid structure. Um, and they used a Markov random field to say that neighboring labels are likely to be similar. So it's a standard approach. And you can get um, a, a slight variant on that is to make a discriminative model instead of a generative model, where now you can have global image features and discriminatively trained local classifiers. But you still have this nearest neighbor label smoothing. And um, the problem with that is that you can't model long-range correlations between pixels. So, um, I mean, there are several problems with this, but that seems to be one that's been overlooked. So um, it's well known that inference in these grid structures is intractable. Um, also, parameter learning in these grid structures is intractable. And you, might, you have to specify the functional form of the potentials. And, and then finally, as I just mentioned, it's, it's very, very myopic, right? It's just saying the label of this patch is likely to be the same as my neighbor's. But if this patch is car, that might be more probable if there's a street sign way over there. So you want to be able to handle these long-range dependencies. So what we did is to come up with um, a heuristic method for essentially overcoming all the problems on the previous slide. So we're basically going to build, um, use boosting to build graph structures for us sequentially. And so it's going to learn the topology of the graph, and this graph structure can be quite long-range. And the way that we're going to, that would normally make inference intractable. Um, but the way that we're going to solve that is essentially use classification to solve inference at every step of the, of, of the procedure. So um, rather than doing, say, belief propagation in the resulting graph. So um, let me walk you through that briefly. So th this is the approach we take. We have an input image. And um, the basic idea is we're going to run our boosted object detectors at every patch, just like we did um, before. Or rather, boosting is allowed to uh, apply um, a local feature any part of the image. But in addition to looking at the image, it's also allowed to look at the output of other detectors at the previous iteration of the algorithm. So, so we're going to have, say, three categories of objects, building cars and roads. And so this is the probability that each pixel is building, or car or road, as opposed to background. Um, and um, at round one of the algorithm, um, all of these belief states are uniform, so they're not informative about each other. So boosting is going to choose to dip into its bag of dictionary features from the image, and maybe it'll pick um, some feature that helps it detect buildings. So it picks some, one of these fragments that help it, helps it detect buildings, applies it everywhere. Now it has a somewhat more refined belief state about where buildings are. And at round two, um, each class is allowed one vote, and it's allowed to either pick a fragment um, coming from the image or coming from one of the other object detectors at the previous round. So it might be, in this synthetic example, the car detector um, says, well, actually, given that the building detector fired quite well, I now know where the buildings are. That gives me more information about where cars are than looking at the image itself. So you treat the output of the previous classifier as if it was an image and, um, and just extract features from that. And you can alternate between dipping into the image or dipping into the, the belief state of the previous classifier. And you just build up sequentially. You're building entire classifiers for every iteration? You, you, you do one weak learner. So every, every round you say, OK, you're allowed one shot to <laughs> touch the image or touch the belief state. And it can mix and match them. But the, so a very similar approach was proposed by um, um, Fink and Prona called mutual boosting. But um, the key difference is that once we add a link between two classes, we keep it in forever. So the graph is actually going to get denser and denser. So now the third round, it might be that the road detector decides to dip into the image. But we already decided that buildings were informative about cars. So we're going to keep that link present. So now once you've decided to look, that cars should look at buildings, it will look every time the building belief state gets updated, cars will... Um, actually sort of absorb a message from the building belief state as well. Because this is getting improved over time, so you need to keep resending the messages. And that's the difference from mutual boosting, which is like a one-shot exchange. Are, are these features, the, the, uh, are they features localized at a point in an image, or are they? Yeah, let, let, so the, um, I think I have, here's a, here's, here, this is what the features are. So the features, when you, the weak learner is allowed to dip into the image and extracts a, apply a random fragment to the image. So the, the methodology we use for the other detectors is, is analogous. So we have um, labeled training data. Um, so we extract random patches of label fields. Okay, so this is like 
at high resolution, sorry, far out we get a bit of building, a bit of car, a bit of road, and then this is a sort of a close-up of that. This is just a, a road building patch. So we have a dictionary of sort of random label fragments, and uh, every, so maybe say 500 of them. At every round in, in weak learning, you're allowed to pick one of these fragments, and let's suppose you pick this one. That tells you that what you should do is look at the pixels below you from the road class and the pixels above you from the building class. So it's essentially, uh, it's a little template that we're going to slide everywhere. And so if I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a pixel from one of these classifiers, um, this is telling me which of my neighbors to look at. And also um, the size of the patch tells you what temp uh, spatial scale. So essentially I'm just sort of fanning out into a bunch of my neighbors at the previous iteration. And it's completely non-parametric, right? We just pick one of these and just say, if I were to add those links, how much would it reduce my entropy, essentially, or increase my classification performance? And you do that greedily at each step. So, it, um, and this is a, um, they, they used a completely different approach, but I like their figure because it's in color. So they were also using, this is a group at Toronto, they were using random fragments of labels. So you can see a, a different scale. So they have a little piece of hippo, piece of water, and a piece of mud. Um, Are you doing it with respect to a particular pixel? Uh, like an it's, do, it's all done in parallel. So the way it works is that, um, cause, just because it's vectorized, right? so it, uh, every pixel is allowed to use the same template, and then we convolve with it. So they all, essentially, you take the fan out, and you replicate it like in a convolution neural network. But, but does each pixel correspond to a weak learner? I mean, to, to depend on one pixel, is that a weak learner? The same weak learner is used for all pixels at any, at any given round. Yep. Would you be choosing the result from one pixel or would you choose the, the whole output? From the whole output. So we're simultaneous, it's the error rate across every pixel. We're trying to label, so we're doing dense classification. You have to get every label right. So you pick the pixel, the, sorry, the feature which on average minimizes classification error across all pixels. So it's like the best bang for the buck. If you're going to die today or tomorrow, what would you do? I'd pick this one because it minimizes error rate for everybody. It's important to use these templates, not just point estimates of like car or building or anything. It's important to use templates as features to kind of smear out. Well, we, we do want to smear out the results to get some sort of smoothing. And also, the, this is essentially when... Yeah, and the, the fragments, um, essentially these, these label fragments are memorizing from the training data what kinds of things co-occur. So the alternative would be you know, to build some statistical model about spatial relationship between object categories. But this is just saying, okay, I'm just going to memorize which, which labels occur next to which other labels at different scales. And so it, you know, it's non-parametric, it makes fewer assumptions, but you know, it may be, we don't really know how well it generalizes. I'll show you some results in a moment. But you can look at the resulting graph structure that it builds. Um, after it's chosen all of these um, uh, fragments, so if you're an arbitrary car pixel, what you should do is basically look at the neighboring pixels around you to see if they're car. And if they are, you're more likely to be car. So that makes sense. That's sort of standard icing smoothing. But you should also look at the pixels which are below you in the road category, and if their road that, that supports you, and if the pixels above you are building, that's good news. But if the pixels below you are not building, then that's bad news. Sorry, if they are building, that's bad news, right? So if you had a building below you, you're probably not a car because cars usually don't occur um, above buildings. This is all image plane modeling; it's not 3D modeling. So essentially, um, you've sort of learned this dense graph topology in this in this greedy way. So uh, let me show you how it works. So at test time, what we do is. So at training time, at every round, we had to choose from one of these 500 dictionary elements and then evaluate its quality. It's still very fast. It's just a matter of minutes. Um, the slowest, no, sorry, it's a matter of hours. It's these normalized cross-correlations that take a long time. But at test time, we've picked a subset of, say, 50 features. So we know exactly which features to use. And we're going to apply them in the same order that we chose um, at training time because training was always greedy, so it chose the most informative ones first. So we have a, a bit of a computational cascade for free. So um, this is how it works for the screen, keyboard, mouse trio of objects. So it, after five iterations, um, it's detected the, um, the screen based on some image fragments. And this is the belief state of a screen. And the other guys are essentially uniform. You don't know where they are. And then after 10 rounds, um, uh, it's, it still has some idea where the screen is. And this information is being uh, somewhat informative about where the keyboard is. So it's sort of starting to light up. And then after a few more rounds, um, the information's propagating for the keyboard's getting a bit sharpened, and that's informing where the mouse might be. And then finally, um, we highlight this region is containing the mouse. And if you threshold those probabilities, you get this labeling, uh, which pixel-wise is pretty good compared to that. Um, 
So if you look at how many pixels you label correctly as a function of time or a function of rounds of boost of, of your uh, classifier, you look at the area under the ROC curve. In the blue um, is this boosted random fields method. This is a screen. So you get screens pretty quickly. Then keyboards kick in, and then mice you get finally. It takes longer to classify all the mouse pixels. Whereas if you just use regular boosting without this notion of swapping information from other classes, so you just apply it to the raw image, you get the curves in red. And um, you know they clearly don't do as well. So maybe I missed it. For your boosting random fields, do you continue to add into the scores, or do you actually reset? So at, at iteration 20, yeah. do you start from zero, or do you start from the output? Of we start from the output of 19. So it's an additive model, right? So we take. So why do you need to keep the link and keep adding it in, keep adding it in? What, why, why, why is mutual boosting not enough? Well, be, the, so the intuition is that. Um, if it was an informative before, at round 10, when you first added it, at round 11, you know more about its belief state than you did at round 10. So you should look at it again. That doesn't double count or over count or something? It might, but then the, we hope that the weights will sort of, if it does, it should learn to sort of um, undo that effect. But at least we're giving it the option. Uh, you know, it could choose to ignore it. I mean, you're saying look at it every round, it might choose to ignore it. Um, you know, we haven't, and uh, in, in hindsight, that's something we should have done. But um. What proportion of the features that it, uh, that it finds, yeah. uh, the read learners, are yeah. based on the image, and what proportion are uh, It depends on the object. So um, for screens, most of them are image-based features, because we actually, you know, it's essentially looking for corners and horizontal and vertical edges. Whereas for mice, there really aren't, I mean, in this image, <laughs> I mean, you can't see the mouse, right? There's essentially no evidence from the image. So it ha relies heavily on um, features from the other detectors, so, which is sort of the behavior we wanted. So then if, if you took that image and sort of Photoshop out the mouse, how, yeah. how likely is it to sort of hypothesize the mouse? Do you think? I think it would be quite likely to do that. So hallucinate things that aren't there. And the noise seems to be choosing just the right. I mean, I don't know what your training set would buy as a right hand for community. Yeah, most of them are to the right. I mean, it's, they, I'm sure it has that bias, but it could. I mean, if it once upon a time chooses the left fragment, then there'll be some probability mass of it there. And then if, but it's, I mean, maybe a nicer model would be, it would hypothesize it's there, and then it would zoom in and verify with some more high resolution thing. Um, but, well, we don't do that right now. It's strictly feed forward. Um, and the, the other weakness of this, in fact, I think I have a, um, oh, I have a, like a scorecard. But w the other weakness of this is that um, the order in which it applies the classifier is fixed. So it essentially learns a, a policy that's good on average. On average, it's best to first find screens, then keyboards, then mice. But it's not going to be adaptive to the particular image at hand. So if you happen to know where the, ma the keyboard is, you should ignore the screen and go straight for the mouse. Um, but it's, you know, it's learning a, a feed-forward circuit, essentially, which is good on average. So, but you know that's simpler than some adaptive approach. This is a similar result for streets. For streets, so we have as a function of time, you know, we we get the buildings first because it's pretty easy to detect buildings and roads. So roads are featureless things, buildings are textury things, and cars are harder. But cars are sandwiched between the building and the road, so these provide a good prediction of where the car is. And um, at the end of the day, you get that kind of labeling out, which is achieved pretty reasonable. Okay, so if we look at, um, so you also get this cascade thing for free. So if you look at the number of pixels that are uncertain, um, so we just threshold, you know, if the, once the probability distribution is sufficiently low entropy, we just stop processing that pixel. So we ask, well, how many um, pixels are uncertain as a function of time? So with the BRF, it drops quite rapidly for screens, um, but more slowly for regular boosting. Um, but for mice, so the difference isn't huge there, but for mice it's a big difference. Using the BRF, you rapidly reduce your uncertainty. But with, um, if you just use the image features, it takes forever, and it doesn't go down very much. So you have to look a long, long time, extract many features from the image until you, you're certain. So this is just showing that the information from the other detectors helps. And it helps some objects more than others, which is very reasonable. Okay, And uh, it's not just the speed thing. You also get improved accuracy. So if you look at the um, detection rate at a pixel level, um, for screens, there's not much win because screens are easy to detect. But for these other harder objects, you get a, a more significant benefit. OK, so just to summarize the BRF story. So the good news is that it's detecting, because we're doing pixel classification, it can detect objects and regions like sky and road, whatever. 
So stuff and things, we call it. Um, and it can handle long-range correlations in the image. And also we get this computational cascade, um, so it's quite efficient. The bad news is, as I already mentioned, it's, it's not an adaptive system. It's a, a fixed circuit that it learns. Um, and also it's, you know, it's labeling every pixel, um, which maybe is not what you want. It's not hypothesis. It's not going to say, I think there are three cars and here they are. It's just going to put labels. So you could clearly post-process this or use this as f for some further system, but um, we haven't done that yet. Okay, so that, um, I'll just um, summarize then. I'll talk about some things we would like to do. So one of them is precisely that, is to develop a system that actually has some notion of objects and uncertainty about the numbers of objects and potentially regions and could perhaps take BRF type output and say, well, I think there are three cars and here they are, as opposed to just giving a flat label field. So this is sometimes called a first order probabilistic model because you don't know how many objects there are. So they, if you think of it as a graphical model, its structure is uncertain. Um, so that's something that's interesting. Another is to look at this active vision idea where um, w the computations that you perform are adaptive and a function of what you currently believe. So it might, be, it might not necessarily be active vision in the sense of moving the camera, although that's an interesting thing, but it might be more computational. So which detector should I run next as a function of what I currently believe? And the BRF does figure out a sort of offline policy that's good on average, but you might want to, if I happen to find something en route, then I should change what I do subsequently. Um, so that's an interesting area. Um, we've been playing a little bit with POMDPs for this, but POMDPs are a nightmare. <laughs> so if anyone has good POMDP algorithms, I'd like to hear about it. And finally, it's clear that we really ought to be modeling spatial relationships and so on in 3D because that's where they naturally reside. And modeling everything in the image plane is, is somewhat limited. Um, and uh, we would get better performance if we could model, if we had 3D models, but that's tricky. But people are starting to look at 3D context. Okay, so that's sort of things that are on the horizon on the vision front. But um, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, I'm actually working on various other things. In fact, I'm working more on biology these days than, than vision. So um, this is just a teaser. You can ask me later if you're interested in these things. One of the projects I've been doing is um, uh, concerned with array CGH data analysis. So this stands for comparative genome hybridization. So the data, you basically get data that looks like this. It's essentially a piecewise constant signal and it's measuring how many copies of a chromosome you have. Um, as you, normally you'd have two at every location, but in some locations you might have more than two, and other locations you might have less than two. And this is, if you have more than two in a region that contains an oncogene, you might get cancer. So this project is um, jointly with the BC Cancer Agency. So they get data that looks like this, and we, uh, the first task is simply to uh, segment that into regions and to label this as, a, this is a region that's um, a lost, you've lost a chromosome, this is neutral. This is a log base 2 ratio. So it's log 2 over 2 is 0. Here you've lost one, and here you've gained one. And you can see it's pretty noisy, so we've done some HMM-type modeling of that. Um, and then there are more interesting things where you want to find patterns that are shared across patients and find what there are sort of idiosyncratic effects, which you're not interested in, but you want to know what does the population share. And these might be signatures of that particular kind of cancer. And you can get subpopulations and so on. So um, that's a, a project I'm kind of excited about. Uh, another thing, I actually gave a talk yesterday at Intel, and, and Mark came to the talk, um, but it's very preliminary work on structured learning um, using convex optimization. So we basically, there's a lot of interest these days on L1 regularization and lasso type things. So people have figured out how to apply that to learning Gaussian graphical models. Um, so there have been several papers on that recently. So this, I have a trick for leveraging that to learn sparse structure from discrete data, so for discrete MRFs. And... Um, well, I can tell you the trick on one slide. It's very easy. Um, so basically, the idea is if I have, say, binary random data, and I want to learn some graph structure on that, I'm actually going to posit that the binary random data was generated by latent Gaussian variables through a logistic link. And I'm actually going to learn sparse graph structure in my latent space and use that as a proxy for sparse graph structure in my observed space. And I use EM, and I use variational inference on the E-step because it's not a conjugate likelihood, and I use some one of these um, convex optimization methods in my M step. So um, uh, anyway, so that, that's I think that's kind of cute, but we need to do more work on that. And then the last thing I'm about I'm about to submit a grant proposal with some um, medical colleagues in Vancouver on learning DBN structure from cell signaling pathways. Um, so I'm basically I'm getting quite interested in structure learning again, and it's motivated partly by the sort of technology pull, so that there's, there's, sorry, the application pull, there are people out there who need this, and also the technology push. I think now there are smarter ideas than just local search 
for structured learning. Um, so I think structured learning is back on the map, at least back on my map. And so I'm, I'm slightly shifting. I'm still doing some vision stuff, but this is taking more of my time. This is more of my recent work. Okay. <laughs>